Yes, yeah, so that's Salazar. Great to be with you. Steve Nichols is going to stop by in just a little bit. Care about Cup between Liverpool and Arsenal. Julian Laurent and Gab Marcotti will stop by as well as we go over the Champions League group phase draw. But let's start in Spain. Barcelona, 3 0 winners over Celta. We go for more. We're joined by Ale Moreno and Frank LeBuff. Ale, I'll start with you. Celta is usually a pretty uncomfortable place for Barcelona to go. Today, they turn in a comfortable performance and they do it. Playing a man down for almost 45 minutes, pretty good stuff, no? Very good from Barcelona, actually. Uh, and before the red card, there was no doubt as to who was going to win this game. Barcelona scores the early goal by Ansu Fati, who again takes his opportunity so very well, takes a touch around the defender and then finishes with the outside of his right foot. Classic finish by him, mature finish by him. And then it just felt like it was only a matter of time for Barcelona to score a second and a third. Now the red card happens and you think, you know, these are the moments in which Barcelona in the past has looked a little vulnerable. This is their moments in which um, they haven't responded all that well. Certainly, as you just mentioned, away in Balaidos and Celta de Vigo, where it hasn't been comfortable for them to the point to where they hadn't won there in five years. And so it, you felt like maybe they're in trouble. And they were not in trouble, not at all. Uh, I thought that tactically they showed that they can be a disciplined team. They went from that 4-2-3-1 to two lines of four. We're going to defend well and then just have Messi float in front of us. And I also think it was important to see the uh, thought process and the substitution pattern for Ronald Koeman and saying, OK, who are we going to sacrifice? In years past, it may have been an easy choice. It may have been Coutinho that you may have sacrificed. Now, not so much, because Coutinho, uh, since he has rejoined Barcelona, has actually played pretty well. Played well against Villarreal, again played well tonight. He stays on the field, and the one that was sacrificed was Antoine Griezmann. So you're trusting Ansu Fati to tactically do the job for you defensively and for Coutinho to keep the ball for you in terms of possession. I thought Barcelona, again, in the second half, were very good with that possession of the ball, even with a man down. And Lionel Messi, who had a quiet first half, second half, more dynamic, more explosive, more impactful, and in the end, Barcelona wins a game 3 nothing that could have been uncomfortable, but was not. Impressive from Barcelona. Frank, not only were they down a man for most of this match, they also had to play in horrible rain. It, it, this was a tough performance from Barcelona, not something that we have called Barcelona quite a bit. What you take away from the match? Um, I think it was a very serious and professional performance. Uh, um, they, they've been quite fortunate as well, on top of being very good, is that uh, in the second half they played with the win. Uh, the win was blowing towards uh, goal, the goalkeeper uh, of Celta Vigo, which is a good plus because it would have been a, maybe a different... Um, a different game, you know, if uh, Celta Vigo would have had the, uh, the win with. So, but overall, you know, as uh, Ali said, you know, everything was perfect. Uh, the way they played, the way they defended, the way they, uh, they act, you know, uh, against uh, Celta Vigo, the way they, they thought about the game, the changes, the substitutions from uh, Kuman uh, when uh, they went down to 10 men and uh, Griezmann was the right choice because he, was, he wasn't the best from far uh, to, 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 to the Barcelona on an attack and uh, it was just fair to keep continue on because he was the best player and then Super because he just called a goal and uh, and showed and showed uh, good qualities uh, at front um, nothing much to say except that um, I'm disappointed by Celta Vigo when you play at Swam 10, 11 against 10, you should show more, um, even against Barcelona, even if you think that they're better. I mean, the aggressiveness put them there, and they let, uh, very, um, Bas they let Barcelona being very, very comfortable, especially with Sergio and uh, De Jong, with no pressure whatsoever. So, it's a normal result, and a very good performance from Barcelona. Ale, uh, everything perfect, unless your name is Antoine Griezmann. As you both have mentioned, he's the one that gets sacrificed when Barcelona goes down a man. And that came after 45 pretty quiet minutes. Uh, what do you make of his performance today, Ale? Yeah, and, and it's, it goes back to last season. It goes back to him trying to figure out what he is in this team. And when Ronald Koeman takes over, one of the first things that Koeman addresses, uh, it's going to be great to see Antoine Griezmann playing his position. Well, I don't even know what Antoine Griezmann's position is anymore because, well, now you have Messi playing in a more advanced role. Coutinho is, is the one that is taking more of the inside position. And then Griezmann is on the right-hand side. And what you see from Griezmann is that he's a guy that balances everything else off. Essentially, what that means is when Messi moves, he has to move. 
when Coutinho moves, also Griezmann has to move. And he, he sort of takes the position that whatever Coutinho left behind or whatever Messi left behind. But it's never Antoine Griezmann the one that initiates a movement. It's never him the one that that actually impacts the game, that changes the game. He is the one that is providing balance, providing cover, tactical discipline. But that's not why you invested the sort of money that you did on a player of such a caliber. You, you want this guy to get the ball in the final third, to create chances for you, to be on the end of chances, to beat people in one-on-one situations, to find a pass, to float around, to rotate. You see him rotating, but you see him rotating to take better defensive positions, not to take better offensive positions. Frank Kuhn has said that uh, Griezmann has a pretty clear and obvious position. He wants to see him there, and yet when you see him play, it's pretty clear they still don't have the fit for him, do they? Uh, yeah, they don't, and uh, I'm very well worried about um, uh, Griezmann's future in Barcelona because I don't see him getting into confidence when he plays. Um, the, uh, the, the the evidence of that is uh, there is a fantastic action in, uh, on the first half, and when Griezmann gets the final uh, ball, when he has to make a control, and he tries the outside of his left foot and misses the control, where it would have been a fantastic goal, and, and Griezmann in Atletico Madrid would have never missed that kind of control. It says a lot about about this uh, lack of confidence that he has. And I agree with Ali. I mean, he doesn't know where to go. He, uh, he composes with, uh, with other movements, with Messi movements or, or Coutinho movements. Uh, he's not helped by Sergio Roberto. I mean, we, you, we, you can see that on the left side with uh, uh, Alba, uh, Coutinho and Ansu Fati, it goes very well. It's very fluid and uh, everything goes right, uh, right. Where on the right side and the opposite side, uh, Sergio Roberto is not as uh, offensive than uh, Alba. Um, Sergio Busquets has a tendency to look for Messi um, as Frankie de Jong and Griezmann is nowhere near it so we don't know what to do with him so I don't know if he's still this position I don't think Griezmann should play on any side it should be Messi and Griezmann maybe at front but now because you have the emergence emergence of Coutinho being so good you have to compose with that so it means again before Suarez had to play with Messi now Coutinho has to play with Messi so Baby Griezmann shouldn't play. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Plenty more from Frank and Alain on today's edition of ESPN FC Extra Time. Stevie joins us to tell us all about his now world-famous hole-in-one shot. Whether in its audio or visual format, do not miss a single episode of The Gab and Jewel Show. The latest episode just published on Thursday features Mark Ogden in what can best be described as an uplifting review of Manchester United's uh, transfer work. A slight bit of an exaggeration there. Great to be joined by the two stars of the show, Gab Marcotti, Julian uh, Laurent. Gentlemen, I know you recorded today's episode just before the Champions League draw came out, so let's take a look uh, at the groups and maybe pick apart some of the headlines here. We'll start in Group A, Bayern and Atleti, the headliners there, Real Madrid and Inter very much the same in Group B. Manchester City, kind of the clear favorites in Group C, as are Liverpool in Group D, but things could get very interesting there with Ajax and uh, Atalanta. Chelsea and Sevilla, the headliners in Group E, wide open Group F, Senate, Dortmund, Lazio, Group G, uh, Messi versus Ronaldo, Juventus and Barcelona, and then uh, what many are hailing as the Group of Death, uh, PSG, Manchester United, Leipzig, and Bashak Shahir uh, of Istanbul down there in Group H. All right, guys, uh, let's start with what every broadcast executive is probably surely salivating out. We got Messi and we got Ronaldo in the group phase. Uh, look, it's great for everybody. It's great for the neutral gap. Gra- it also feels like maybe one of the last times we're going to see these two in this format anyway in their prime. It is, and I mean, I think that is the one overarching message here. You know, th- these two guys uh, are ha- have defined the last, what, 10 to 15 years uh, in, in, in global football. And, you know, at some point, this is going to end, and they're still doing it today. And so, you know, you kind of get a sense that, you know, every minute that, that they're on the pitch, every time you see them step on the pitch, I'm not suggesting it's going to be their last time, but it could be the last time that they are as good as they are now. So grab your popcorn, uh, clear space in your diary, and sit down to watch this because, you know, this has been probably 
probably the greatest rivalry, the most defining rivalry between sort of number one and number one A um, in the history of football, maybe in the history of sports. And, uh, and so, yeah, there's no question that that is the main plot. Obviously, there's sub subplots, both you and Barcelona, uh, with, with new managers, both of them with a lot of question marks, um, both of them exchanging players over the summer. But, but really, it is about those two. Jules, it seems pretty likely uh, Barcelona and Juventus will go through. Who do you suppose, though, is the favorite in the group between the two sides, based on what we've seen so far this season? Well, I think it's hard because the form that we've seen uh, so far, I don't think it would make any sense when they both play each other, even in, I don't know, let's say five weeks' time, for example, after the international break. Things could get better. They should get better for Juventus with Pirlo putting his, all his ideas in place. Same with Ronald Koeman. They, have, they might have new players. Or there's, there's a lot of things that can happen between now and, and when they face each other. I just think I agree with what Gab was saying. And also, I think there will be, there'll be no pressure, really, because they're going to smash Dynamo Kiev and Ferenc Varos. So let's enjoy that game with no tension, no pressure. Let them do their thing. Let them enjoy that encounter as well, because for all the time that we've put them against each other now they're really against each other in the sense of like this is a group that you're both going to go through let's have fun and, 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 and make the best win alright turning our attention to group H is where we find Manchester United if you go off online off Twitter gab uh, Manchester United fans are very very nervous should the manager Ole Gunnar Solskjaer be nervous about getting out of this group well, first and foremost, you should be nervous about what's going to happen in the last hours of the transfer window, which, of course, shuts on Monday. And I think they still have some business they'd like to get done. But once he gets beyond that, I don't know if worry is the right word, but he's undoubtedly going to be very aware that Paris Saint-Germain and, and Leipzig, for, for different reasons, uh, these teams earned the Champions League stripes last year. They showed what they could do in, in getting to the final and semifinal. Uh, they're not going to be at all intimidated in this context. And uh, while Leipzig lost Timo Werner, I think, if it's not Sorlos, I think they can beat you with other ways. And, of course, Paris Saint-Germain, you're still talking Neymar, you're still talking uh, Kylian Mbappe, and you're talking a lot of confidence. So, yeah, I, I think he should, uh, he should be worried and, and, and respectful. Jules, four days left in the transfer window. If United don't make a move, how confident are you in that they can get out of this group? Even if they make a move, even if they sign Alex Tejas, for example, at left back, I don't, I, I'm still not sure if they will go through that group stage because I think Leipzig has a, a very dangerous team. I think it's a very tricky draw for, for United. We will see tomorrow on Friday the scheduling and the fixture list and, and when they play who and where, and then maybe we'll have a better idea. But it's a, it's a very difficult draw, I think, for them, for, that, for, that, for the top two finishes because I think PSG will finish first of the group and then it will be between Leipzig and them. And, and right now, I think Leipzig have a lot more momentum than United have. Group D definitely does not stand for uh, defense as we look at it. Liverpool, Ajax, Atalanta, Michelin out of Denmark. Gap, yeah, this is one certainly for the neutrals, isn't it? Yeah, I think this is one for the uh, for the purists, the ones who love a certain uh, brand of football. Um, Ajax, maybe not what they were two years ago. Obviously, everybody's left, and I think even in terms of, of spirit and, and, and attitude, you know, they're still trying to get that back. But but obviously, uh, uh, tremendous when, when when they unfold going forward. Atalanta, I think, you know, they are now established already. They show the first two games of the season, um, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't discount Michelin either, who, you know, maybe their first time uh, at the rodeo, but uh, they are a very attacking team that plays by very attacking principles as well. So I think this is the uh, group where you generally take the over. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people will be taking Liverpool between Ajax and Atalanta. Jules, you got to lean? I'll go for Atalanta. I think they, again, the momentum from last season, the way they've started this season already, the fact that Ilicic will come back, the fact that they, you know, they, they still have, that they've got that confidence. It's a system that they know so well. And they were going to be devastating. And I, I love Ajax. I just think that this Atalanta team is, is more talented. One more group to focus on then, that is uh, Group E, where we find Real Madrid and Inter. They're in there with Shakhtar and Gladbach. Any threat there to either of those two teams, Gab? Oh, I think definitely. Uh, definitely. I mean, it's not just the, point, the fact that obviously, you know, Zinedine Zidane still trying to square things tactically, what he wants to do with Real Madrid. But uh, Gladbach's Marco Rose 
you don't know what you're going to get. Um, really, really interesting uh, manager. He showed it last year. Um, they're a very difficult team to play against. They have that Salzburg Red Bull pedigree and, uh, and obviously likes of Turam and, and play up front. Uh, and as far as Hector Genetsk, you know, you just go back in recent history. Managers may change, things may come and go, um, but they have, a, they have a tremendous record in this competition. They've reached the knockout rounds uh, on several occasions. And uh, yeah, this is, I, I think for me, this is one of the two tightest groups out of all of them. Jules, Real Madrid can't score, Inter can't really defend, things could get interesting here, yeah? <laughs> I think it would be fascinating. For me, that's the, that's the group. These great because of football and the way they're going to attack and everything, but this one is fascinating because I can see Gladbach going through, you can see Shakhtar going through, you can see Real Madrid and you can see Inter going through, all of them. And there's a lot of little stories, Eden Hazard meeting Conte again, you know, there's so much, so much going on in that group and I think it would be, it would be quite on the edge. I can't see one of those four teams winning all their games, for example, I think it would be quite tight. Guys, one more bit of news uh, from today then to go over. Robert Lewandowski, surprise, surprise, UEFA's uh, Player of the Year. Gab, that's not su the surprise. The surprise is that as far as the voting goes, he accumulated more points than guys 2 through 10 combined. A testament to the dominant season Lewandowski had. Yeah, absolutely. When, when, when you have a team that's so dominant the way Bayern were and winning the treble, a lot of times, you know, you see people voting for different players on their team. Maybe one guy goes for Muller, maybe Kimmich. You know, we saw that a bit with Liverpool last year, the player of the year voting, where you had three or four candidates. But uh, so I, I think it's definitely interesting. For me, unexpected that, that all those people wanted to reward Bayern, they all seem to coalesce around Lewandowski. I think quite clearly it's to do with his, with his scoring exploits uh, in the Champions League in particular. Jules just goes to show, who needs the Ballon d'Or when you've got the uh, player of the year for UEFA, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Lewandowski would have loved as well the Ballon d'Or on the mental piece, just next to each other, you know? Absolutely. Uh, all right, let's take a list, uh, look at the list of other players who have uh, earned some hardware from UEFA this year. Start on the men's side and pretty much a clean sweep for Bayern Munich, no surprise there. Your manager of the year, Hansi Flick, your goalie of the year, Manuel Neuer. Kimmich in there as your defender of the year, Kevin De Bruyne breaking up the party as your midfielder of the year. Oh, by the way, Lewandowski as if not enough. Also, your forward of the year. On the ladies' side, Pernilla Harder wins both player and forward of the year from Chelsea, Jennifer Marajan. Your midfielder of the year, Wendy Bernard. Your defender of the year, Sarah Bouadi, uh, helping out that Lyon sweep as your goalie of the year. Liverpool Arsenal very much the marquee matchup as far as Monday's Carabao Cup showdowns were concerned. 90 minutes, scoreless, they went to penalties. Arsenal winning. 5-4 more. We welcome back Frank LaBeouf. We welcome in Steve Nichols. Steve, uh, what do you make of the match? Arsenal deserving winners. Obviously went with a much closer to full strength lineup than Liverpool did. Uh, no, Arsenal weren't deserved winners at all. Um, <clears throat> you know, basically this was almost two reserve sides. Uh, both Liverpool and Arsenal had two or three players that would have started in a what we might call a proper game. But the, the game itself ended up being a battle of the two goalkeepers. And, and Bert Leno came out over Adrian uh, with a 5-2 win. You know, Bert Leno on five occasions made great saves uh, for shots that were goal-bound. Um, and Adrian made two. So that's why we ended up going to penalties. And then, of course, again, it was a battle of the goalkeepers. And... Uh, but Leno came out on top again. So that's why Arsenal are through, because they were better at penalty kicks. Uh, they certainly weren't better than Liverpool during the game. Um, it wasn't the greatest of games, but there were some chances, as I've said, because the goalkeepers uh, obviously had to produce what they did. Um, and Arsenal go through, but not deservedly. Frank, we've seen Liverpool and Arsenal quite a bit over the last few weeks, and usually it's been a pretty good, pretty wide-open match. Today, that was not the case. No, I didn't enjoy the game. I mean, um, uh, I agree with uh, Stevie. I think Liverpool should have gone through, but uh, nobody will remember the consistency of the, of the of the game. They will remember the result and the fact that uh, Arsenal and the Gunners uh, went through and uh, and will play the the other run. Uh, but I was watching at the same time, working hard for ESPN, uh, the first half of Barcelona, uh, Celta Vigo Barcelona, and uh, therefore and. So Liverpool uh, uh, Arsenal, 
And, and, and I was quite bored. I mean, the lack of, pa of, uh, of um, good passes, the lack of technique especially, uh, were shown during that, uh, that game. Not necessarily every time from the youth player, or, uh, but also from the experienced one. Uh, it wasn't a great game. It wasn't a pretty game to watch. Uh, Arsenal did what they had to do. And again, uh, as TV said, you know, uh, fortunately, Leno was uh, as it, as it at its best, sorry, and uh, and um, he deserved to go through. I don't know if his teammates did, but I think Leno did everything to go through. Stevie, uh, Van Dijk and Mo Salah really the only two full-time starters that got the start today for Liverpool. Maybe an insight into how much this means to Jurgen Klopp and company. Are you disappointed at all that they're out of the League Cup, or is this actually better for a Liverpool team that needs to open up its schedule? Uh, I don't think it is. It was the first thing I was thinking about, you know, I'm, uh, I'm saying to myself, well, you know, when you only put two or three of starters out, is it really worth it? But then actually it is because it's an opportunity to get players time on the field. Uh, you know, another couple of signings to Liverpool in this window uh, and the squad's getting bigger uh, and better. And so, you know, to, to be able to, to push who's ever in the Saturn eleven, uh, you need to to produce something on the field and it's going to be difficult uh, I think they've got what the FA Cup is the only thing left it's going to be difficult for those those players even even the likes of Jogo who who, who looked good in his, in his debut uh, at the weekend it's going to find a hearty game time and that means that the fitness and the sharpness is going to be affected so so yes at the end of the day I think it would have been better for Liverpool to go through uh, for that reason alone and also that young players would get more experience as well. Thanks, gentlemen. Carabao Cup then moves to the quarterfinal round. Draw is set. We'll get Stoke City against Spurs, Brentford, Newcastle, Arsenal, Manchester City, and Everton, Manchester United. Those matches start the week of December 21st. Busy day in the Europa League on Thursday. Remember the players from Maccabi Haifa that made a video making fun of Harry Kane? Didn't turn out too well. Kane dropped hat tricks. Spurs win 7-2. Milan need extra penalties to get past Portuguese side Rio Ave. Celtic 1-0 winners over Sarajevo. Rangers also advancing 2-1 over Galatasaray. The draw for the group stage will go down Friday among the many things. We'll look to cover on Friday. Shows we look ahead towards the weekend. Of course, Extra Time, a daily feature on ESPN FC. Here's a taste of what we got into in today's episode. Frank, what a choice Andrew has given you for our next question. Virgil van Dyke or Vincent Company? Ooh. Ooh. Uh. I will, I, will, I will go for Virgil van Dijk because I'm a real fan of him and every time I watch him, uh, I feel that when he's really tuned in, the guy is, is unstoppable. When he's let's go, let's, when he lets go, you know, sometimes, you know, we can feel that uh, he, he can be surprised. Uh, Vincent Company had a, very, a fantastic career, but I think technically he had some issues comparing to van Dijk. I mean, he was... He was he, he was a, a dog. He, he didn't. He never let go. He was a captain. He had a character. I mean, he's a he's a good friend of mine, and I really uh, I'm really keen of uh, what he did, and I really like the guy. But in terms of football, what I see it, what I like in football, I like the elegance of uh, of Van Dijk and uh, the performances of Van Dijk. Ah, extra time where we are never 